Hi, everyone. Uh, so my name is Rishabh. Thank you so much for the introduction. And thanks for the amazing first session. Uh, really loved it. So basically, uh, yeah, we are starting with the recommendation session. And in this particular half an hour slot, I'm going to be talking about how can we think about diversity and fairness in these multi-stakeholder uh, marketplaces. So in this talk, I'm going to focus on starting with like some brief background on multi-stakeholder platforms. And I know like, like both Martin and Life has been talking about multi-stakeholder problems, and this is just one instance in a recommendation setting. I'm going to just briefly talk about a few case studies and then talk about two examples of fairness in multi-stakeholder problems. So these are really like two different views of some of these problems. In the first view, I'm going to look at like specifically supplier fairness and talk about like how does it trade off between user relevance. In the second part, I'm going to focus more on objectives and then look at the problem from a lens of fairness across objectives that how can we have equitable allocations across different objectives. And towards the end, I want to spend like five minutes just talking about broader questions because I really believe that there's a lot of open questions. We're just starting to uncover what does this topic mean in these multi-stakeholder platforms. So yeah, just a quick background on multi-stakeholder platforms. And essentially, uh, I just want to remind everyone that like as a community uh, in, in search and recommended systems both, we have been mostly user-centric in our approach, in our thinking, in our evaluations, in our user studies and our uh, like logging information and our ob like objectives, which our models optimize for. And over the last two decades, we have done a lot of work around developing models, which make the users happy, uh, which are tracking users' needs and kind of fulfilling them on the go. And interestingly, like when we start looking at some of these new upcoming companies and these interfaces, then we ask the question, is caring about the user enough? And perhaps a lot of these companies care about the user, but also care about the other stakeholders involved in the process as well. So in general, if we, if we look at this problem, the question then becomes that, how do we care about multiple stakeholders in these platforms when we are designing our search and recommend the systems? So just a quick example would be that if you're, let's say if you're creating the homepage, then you can select a card, select a playlist, and up until now, you would be very user-centric in your objectives you optimize for. And now, instead of just being user-centric, you want to care about multiple stakeholders and each stakeholder could provide one or more objectives to you. And here we kind of go into this multi-objective world of optimization. Just looking at a couple of case studies to better motivate the problem uh, and also give a wider context on what kind of objectives these systems will uh, tackle and how do we think about fairness in those. So one example is Uber Eats or any like Deliveroo if you're in the UK. Uh, your, fav your favorite like food delivery companies in, in whichever region you are in the world. So here the stakeholders are the eaters. Like I want to be able to, uh, yeah, let me just bring this back here. Oh, come on. Right, so one of the stakeholders is the eater. And as an eater, I want to discover an order of food as a restaurant provider, I, I see it as a sales channel and also delivery partners. Interestingly, if you look at this problem, then if you don't have enough eaters, then restaurants won't participate. If you don't have enough restaurants, then the selection opportunity to the eater decreases. If the number of orders decrease, then the delivery partners earn very less. So again, like unbalanced market demand supply dynamics degrades the overall experience. So here, I mean, some of the objectives which a system like Uber Eats or others could optimize are eater conversion rate and, and a bunch of others. But I just want to focus a bit more on a couple of them. So one is exposure of restaurants. So my, to a certain extent, the amount of money I earn from a restaurant depends on how often am I surfaced in the recommendations on some of these platforms. And not just restaurants, like earnings per delivery partner is also mandated by how the main matching model matches the delivery partner to the specific order. So again, here we are starting to see that some of the search and recommendation implications of the decisions have implications on like the restaurants and delivery partners. Another example quick running through this would be Etsy. So Etsy is a marketplace for craftsmen and we have buyers, we have sellers, we have the platform itself. So it's a three-sided marketplace. And if you look at some of the sellers, then they want to target larger audiences and potential buyers. They want to run campaigns more effectively. And as a platform, like Etsy would want to build a healthy ecosystem, right? And they want to speed up the buyer and seller communication to kind of close the deals quickly. Another famous example is Airbnb. And here it's a two-sided marketplace connecting hosts and guests. And essentially here, uh, you can optimize your objectives. Some of these could be, uh, my ear cord is holding up a bit. Yeah, so some of these objectives could be conversion, number of bookings and so on. If you look at some of these closely, uh, you want to optimize the number of bookings per host and not just global, but also for your tail host as well. 
And in general, if you're looking at helping hosts who may not host that often or who go on a vacation and come back. So there's a lot of these scenarios. And there's this Medium article uh, from Airbnb engineering team, which talks about some of these in great detail. So I highly recommend going through that. And again, like Spotify use case as well, like Spotify or any music streaming or movie streaming companies, uh, they do care about the suppliers, which are the artists and, and the movie providers and the fans, which are the consumers of, of music. So basically with this background, one of the things which we want to get across is like, how do we start thinking about fairness in this multi-stakeholder problems? So as I mentioned, we're gonna talk about two lens from this. One is the supplier fairness and fairness across objectives. So when we start looking at supply fairness and consumer relevance trade off, then again, like, yeah, we're talking about work which we did at Sikkim. And here in this paper, we started talking about how do you go towards a fair marketplace and how do we balance the user relevance with supply fairness and the impact it has on user satisfaction. So here, if you look at it closely, then most of these platforms suffer from something called the superstar economics. So again, the recommendations we do are often based on predicted relevance. So we try to predict a relevance, relevance score between users and, and the items based on any sort of complicated or simple models which we can deploy. Now, in general, we, we always see a long tail of suppliers which don't get exposed a lot. And the long tail could be respect to multiple things. It could be with popularity, it could be with exposure, it could be predicted relevance and, and, and a bunch of other cases. But if you look deeper, then a number of reasons might result in such disparities. It could just be that like users of prior have prior familiarity with certain certain uh, suppliers. So again, like maybe I'm already, I mean, off platform content and off platform interactions could also play a role over here. So again, like a lot of these things kind of tend to have this extrogenous uh, influence on the dynamics of such the, such platforms and marketplaces, which might result in some of these superstar economics problems. But interestingly, like if, if I'm a supplier, right, then I want a fair opportunity to be presented to the user. So if I'm a restaurant, then I want to be exposed to relevant queries, to relevant users, so that I can get traffic my way. And in general, we starting to conjecture that if I just, if these systems blindly optimize for relevance, then it might just have a detrimental impact on the supplier fairness. Now again, like what does fair opportunity even mean? And that's also a question of a debate and like up for consideration here. So the key question we're gonna focus on in the next five minutes is if I look at two stakeholders, the user and some of the suppliers, then how do we balance between the relevance of the user and some exposure diversity? So exposure diversity is a way to instantiate the fairness objective for suppliers. So just quick definitions. By relevance, we mean a recommendation is relevant if it's closed read resembles user's interest profile and you can have your favorite embedding based models or any uh, complex neural network to do that. You can look at satisfaction as relying on implicit feedback. So again, we can track a lot of these uh, online behavior of users and then derived satisfaction metrics for them. And for this specific word for fairness, we look at group fairness across supplier groups. Now, what does a fairness definition over here look like? So again, like just in this work, we, we said that like, we can say that a set of tracks is fair if it contains tracks from suppliers which belong to multiple groups. And there's a function over here, which, is, which has a nice property that it's a submodular function, uh, which are kind of easy to optimize in a, in a greedy optimization world. So a quick example of what this function would do. So here we are seeing group fairness across different suppliers. So let's say I pick up the po popularity of these suppliers and then divide them into different bins and buckets. So now I have the red bucket, I have the pink buckets and I have the green buckets, right? So these are three different groups of suppliers based on popularity. Now, if I just purely optimize for the submodular function, then I can say that if you are choosing four suppliers and two of them are from the red, one from pink, one from green, then that value is greater than selecting all throw from any one of these. So now this function in itself is a very nice, again, it's a very cute mathematical trick that gives me, like encourages the system to pick up content from multiple suppliers. So this is great. I mean, I can use this then as a way of diversity and just kind of say that, let's assume that that's a fairness metric for suppliers we use for, for the time being. Just a quick note on fairness, right? I mean, there's, there's a numerous attempts to define what fairness actually means. And it's unlikely that there will be one universal definition. I'm preaching to the choir here. I mean, we, a lot of people on the call know a lot more about all these definitions and how we can instantiate and use them. So again, like in, in this 
framework, I mean, we are amenable to other interpretations, interpretations and definitions of, of fairness. So let's just, for now, let's just use one of these and then see what happens. Great, so now we are, we are saying that, okay, I'm looking at some music consumption on a platform and then I want to understand the trade-off between consumer relevance and supplier diversity or supplier fairness. So if I put, if I randomly sample a set of playlists, so each of the playlists is a set and on the x-axis, I plot the, uh, the, the measure of fairness, which is the diversity estimate. On the y-axis, we plot relevance. So we see here that things at the top right are blank. So very few sets have both high relevance and high supplier diversity. So the conjecture over here being that optimizing just for relevance without explicitly considering fairness will have an adverse impact on the supply fairness. So now for that, we need uh, recommendation policies which account for supply fairness as well. So some of these nice things you could do is like just purely optimize for relevance, purely optimize for fairness, or you could do some things in between. Like you could trade off, you can have some guaranteed relevance that as long as you can guarantee me that I'm not gonna tank below, let's say 0.8 relevance, I'm okay with you optimizing for uh, fairness or diversity. So it's a constraint optimization problem. Or we can look at some adaptive policies. Again, not going into much detail, but the adaptive policies here say that there are certain users who are more okay with the platform recommending diverse content and certain users don't really like it. So based on the user's receptivity levels, we can tweak the recommendation policy to show supplier fairness or kind of not respect some of these uh, diversity constraints. So interestingly, we start seeing some, some, some good results over here. So on the x-axis, we have the parameter which adjusts how much respect you want to give to supplier diversity versus relevance. And on the y-axis, we have user satisfaction. So again, a bunch of these results are from some of the counterfactual evaluations uh, techniques which we've kind of using internally. So one of the things you start noticing is that there are inflection points over here. So these are inflection points which provide us good trade-off that I can get decent enough gain in supply diversity without hurting user satisfaction by that much. But definitely there is a trade-off here. And now we are dealing in a world of trade-offs. But very importantly, if you also look at how some of these models perform, then the adaptive models, the user adaptive models, they give us the best trade-off. So here we're getting the max gain uh, in user satisfaction uh, and we are losing least in terms of the diversity estimate as well. So this provides us good reasons that we should not just be having personalization policies, but instead we should be having meta-personalization that I want to be able to personalize how much diversity will I be respecting to a different user. So this is what a user level heterogeneity in diversity looks like, that not all users would be okay with you doing them to, for that. And now this, is, this has deep implications for us as a community when we're thinking about fairness and, and diversity in, in these platforms, that there's gonna be interaction effects and we're gonna see them again and again and again that when you optimize something, when you try to make a system behave somehow for a certain set of stakeholders, the other stakeholders get impacted. So now we have to accommodate for these interaction effects across multiple stakeholders when we are trying to see how the system will perform overall. So the take home message is being so far that there's an interplay between consumer relevance and supply diversity and we live in a world of trade-offs. And we start observing that there's a varying degree of user receptivity. Uh, and in general, we need to be considerate of the interaction effects across consumers and suppliers. So let's take a step back. So here, up until now, we are saying that there are platforms wherein we have users and suppliers and we care about at least one objective from both the sides. But what if we go deeper, like as a system, I want to be able to optimize for multiple objectives across multiple stakeholders. And how do we do that at scale? So here, the lens which we want to look at this work is across by, by looking at fairness across objectives. So in a multi-stakeholder platform, I have multiple stakeholders and each of these stakeholders contribute some objectives which they care about. And now I want to prefer some equitable allocations to each of these objectives. So again, up until now, the lens we were looking at the work was that there's a supplier and across suppliers, I want to be fair. What is fairness? How do we do that? That's the question. But now we are taking another look. We're saying that, okay, I have multiple objectives in a system and I want to be fair across all the different objectives. And this is traditionally what a multi objective machine learning models are trying to do as well. So here we care about balancing multiple objectives and let's say some of these 
example of objectives could be user satisfaction. There could be three of them like stream time, flex, items consumed. It could be diversity of suppliers. Uh, it could be promotional objectives that there's a specific set of suppliers I want to expose more on the platform. So we start seeing some very intuitive things that the different satisfaction metrics are correlated with each other. So that's great. I mean, if I optimize for one, I get the other for free. But the supply diversity is almost neutral. And importantly, when you randomly sample some suppliers and want to boost them, then it starts kind of creating problems because you see like some negative correlations pop up over there. So that means like to balance multiple objectives, we have to do something more advanced and just the weighted interpolation will not kind of play it out nicely. So we, we tackled this work at a recent KDD paper, which we presented, wherein we were looking at joint optimization via uh, contextual multi-object abundance. So I'm not gonna talk about this paper in great detail, but I'm gonna talk about one specific function which we use, which we kind of create our model around and show how that function can give us more, uh, increasingly more equitably, equity, equitable allocations across objectives. So again, this slide, I, I kind of showed at the start that we have multiple stakeholders and we should optimize for some functions which are multi-objective in nature. And the code function which we use in this work is the generalized Gini function. So the, the Gini index has been traditionally like very, very common, very, very uh, applicable and used across measuring income inequalities. And here we try to take an extended version of that. So a generalized Gini function says that it's a special form of ordered weighted averaging. So it is weighted averaging, but in a slightly different manner. And it respects this pigeon delta transfer that it prefers allocations that are more equitable. So I'm gonna spend the next five minutes talking a bit about the properties of this function, and then just kind of give a hand wavy uh, image of how we use them in a, in a multi-objective bandit setting. So the generalized Gini functions is a special case of ordered weighted averaging. So weighted averaging is simple, like W1S1 plus W2S2. So ordered weighted averaging essentially says that uh, we, we care about ordering the vectors first and then using that permutation, we assign the weights. So essentially what that means is that here the weights are, are not assigned to attributes. They are assigned to the sorted scores. So if I have a vector of five objectives, so the W1 corresponds to the weight to the highest objective, regardless of which of these five objectives it is. So it, it, it has a very beautiful uh, implication for us that now if I control the weights, because I'm sorting the objectives, so now I can control, uh, dynamically control the importance given to different attributes. So this is the key property over here that in, in, in runtime, because the objectives don't get a fixed weight and the weight is based on the importance you want to give to that objective, so you have this more dynamic control uh, as your policy plays out in production. And this is the, the, one of the most nice things about this function that it respects this principle, this prefers allocations that are more equitable. So let me dive in a bit more into what, what it means. So the picture of Dalton principle says that a gap diminishing transfer from someone with more to someone with less, it decreases the overall inequality. So again, there are a few points here. It's gap diminishing that if there's a gap between uh, two things or two people or two attributes, then if we transfer from someone with more to someone with less, is gonna decrease the inequality. And in general, if I look at like, let's say X, which is three objectives, and let's say these are the scores for the different objectives. So if I do a del uh, epsilon transfer from the third to the second, then it's gonna end up in a world which is a slightly has less inequality across these objectives. And this is exactly what the Gini function does. So if I look at this, this PD principle, the Pichot Dalton principle, it's a kind of a kinder, gentler cousin of the Pareto principle. That the Pareto optimality prefers efficiency while this PD principle prefers equity across allocation, allocations. So let's look at like what, what we meant by the GGF function respecting this principle. So, if I look at all X's, so, so again, X is a vector of objectives and let's say XJ is a higher scoring objective than XI. And I want to transfer something from XJ to XI, but only by a slight amount, not greater than the difference between the two. So effectively what that means is that the Gini index function, wherein we are making X by transferring something from the i attribute of the vector to the J, sorry, from the J to the i 
then that Gini function of x is going to be having a higher value than uh, just x without that equitable transfer. So here, now we're transferring from somebody with more to somebody with less and thereby decreasing inequality across the different objectives we care about. So again, this transfer allows us to balance the reward vector. So now if certain objectives are getting more reward, then if you want to be equitable, then now we can do this optimization and then try to have more balancedness in our outlook towards these objectives. So one of the nice things, there's a paper from uh, 1980s which says that if you have this GD function, then you can solve it by directly solving a linear program. So again, like if, if you have multiple objectives and you want to impose a Gini function, gen, uh, generalized Gini function on top of it, then you can simply solve this linear program and get the corresponding weights, which give you this equitable allocations. The problem is that like when we're trying to have a real world deployment, then this is computationally very expensive that I do not want to do that at each round of bandits. So now in that paper, uh, in the KDD paper, we propose a gradient SN based solution. So again, I'm not gonna go into much details, but now we try to say that we want to optimize a multi-objective function in a contextual bandit setting, and we use this GGF function over here. So again, I don't have time to go through the entire bandit model over here, but it's a very typical contextual bandit setting wherein we want to find an arm selection strategy. We have a bandit round and we have some features. We try to predict the reward. The reward is not a single scalar reward. It's a vector of rewards because we are in a multi-objective world. And again, because a lot of these like means, mean reward for each arm is not known. So then we kind of say that uh, the policy is given by this maximizing of this Gini function. And this function itself is the GGF function, which we were talking about. And in general, it gives us some very good results. So again, if I just care about users and no other stakeholder, even in that case, a multi-objective met method on multiple satisfaction metrics performs better. So the takeaway from that was that if you care about multiple interaction metrics, then optimizing for multiple of these performs better than optimizing each of these independently. So there's some chaining effect across metrics, which gives you those, those gains. And if we start adding some competing objectives, like let's say gender exposure. So we pick up some certain suppliers and try to boost them. Then we start seeing that we can get gains without hurting user satisfaction. So perhaps it's, it need not be a zero sum game over here. So again, like this provided us with another lens of viewing multiple objectives from this lens of fairness and kind of the GDF function allows us to have equitable allocations across different objectives. Now it's very powerful. We have used it in just one setting in one type of application, but then I'm very hopeful that like such kind of principles will allow us to balance multiple objectives across stakeholders in many scenarios. And finally to end, uh, I just want to devote the last two minutes to talk about broader questions. Like some of these questions pop up again and again, and we're barely scr scratching the surface on some of these problems. So the first question, which we want to raise is like, how do we start quantifying supplier fairness? And what does, so, so there are certain suppliers, like if you look at Amazon, then there are certain retailers on the platform who have uh, like hundreds and thousands of products. Do you want to give equal exposure to them as compared to some retailers who don't have as many products? Some suppliers on the platform would have been on the platform for a long enough time and like users would have created this like brand image and like brand association with those. So again, like controlling for all of these things and then kind of coming up with like, okay, what's a nice distribution of exposure? That's a very hard problem. So how do we start thinking about these in, in, a, in a marketplace setting? So what should be the target distribution? So if you're looking at a distribution across exposure, then what should the final distribution be? Should it be a uniform distribution or are we still okay with a long tail distribution, but with certain properties? And we can, we can talk about like target away calibrations. Like I want to get to the stage of distribution of exposure, but like, do I want to do it on a global level as a platform entirely, or do we want to do it on a user level? Because there are user level preferences baked into our recommendation policies. The next question is interaction effects. Anything we do on one stakeholder will have an impact on the other stakeholders. How do we start balancing these together? If I, if I change one system, I will have to worry about five other systems going, going like bust. So the question like, how do we develop these robust models which account for the interaction effects? And the question says like, we are definitely living in a world of trade-offs and how can these fairness methods coexist in our matching models? 
The next question is evaluation time frame. When are we evaluating it? Is it just like a one-off evaluation or is it like short term, long term? So in the short term, long term, you can maybe take a hit in the short term and say that, okay, I'm gonna do a bit screwed up policies in the one week, but in the long enough time frame, I'm gonna come back as a winner and be more fair overall. And also like, do you want to do it on each session? Do you want to do it across all sessions? Do you want to do it across all sessions on the platform? So again, we have multiple abstractions at which we could think about these problems and then try to answer these questions. Attribution, in a multi-objective world, attribution is a key problem. Like, is your, I mean, if you're doing explanations, attribution is something which Martin was also alluding to. So in a multi-objective ranking, multi-objective recommendation, where is this inequality popping up from? Is it because this is the objective you're optimizing for a wrong objective among a set of five objectives? So what's the culprit, what to fix are all very important and non-trivial problems. And finally, something like opportunity space mapping that I want to do good, I want to be fair, but where can I do that in these recommendation platforms? So can we, can we detect these opportunistic areas where we can double down and try to fix things? So a couple of papers we've had recently is looking at search. So search provides us certain queries and non-focused search queries like relaxing music. So their users are open to non-specific recommendations. And that's great. I mean, users would love certain things and the, and that's very underspecified. So now maybe we can expose certain daily artists or underserved content over there. Or we can start looking at consumption diversity. So some users are okay with more diversity in the recommendations and that allows us to shift consumption because it's, it's, it's an opportunity for the platform to show some underserved content or some specific types of suppliers and thereby kind of shift consumption towards diverse content. So the plot on the right you see here, it's like the, the, the red one is the default policy. The, the, the blue one is the RL policy and we are shifting consumption towards the right, towards the tail a bit. So again, these are just a couple of examples in which we can try to kind of do this opportunity space mapping and then try to kind of expose certain suppliers to kind of be more fair overall in the platform. So with that, uh, yeah, that's that's my time. And hopefully the, the, the summary is like, we're just barely scratching the surface of these problems in a multi-objective world. And we, we live in a world of trade-offs between multiple stakeholders. And there is a lot of open problems here, which perhaps as a community, we can start thinking about. Thank you very much. Uh... Risha, for your fantastic talk uh, and uh, thought-provoking questions at the end. So uh, please uh, put your Q&A questions in there, in the panel. Um, so we have actually two questions. Uh, we can address only one of them now, and uh, we will uh, ask the other questions in the end of the session. So I'll just, yeah, so I'll just start with the first one I said, um, we have a question by uh, Yak Xiong, and uh, the question is, um, you mentioned that we need uh, to consider, um, we, need to, we need to consider the interaction effect across consumers and suppliers. Can you give some details about the effects of interaction, feedback loops in the multi-stakeholder yeah. marketplaces? Yeah, I think I think like there, there are a few things here. One is like a lot of these recommendation problems, like users are malleable. I mean, they I mean we can shape and influence their habits as well. So again, like on a social system, like I have like specific information need. But if I'm watching a Netflix movie, then or if I'm listening to music or if I'm kind of uh, just browsing on Pinterest, then my information need is broad enough and you can influence the platform can influence my my preferences. So now that means like you can try to inculcate habits in the users. So some habits are more rewarding because now, I mean, if suddenly users start listening to more diverse content, then that gives, that serves the platform in a better way. So the interaction effect is that there are certain things you do to the user and that's gonna play out not just on the user side, but also on the supplier side. So if you start, again, if you start promoting a lot of these like action movies on Netflix, then users might just start liking more action movies, right? And that's gonna have an impact on the user preferences because their recent taste is gonna evolve accordingly. But now in future as well, you're gonna have an impact on other genres of movies, which the user may not like, like, like enough, right? So again, any of the things you do is gonna play out not just on the user side of things, but also it will, have, it will play out on the supplier side and also like the platform side, because some of this content is more precious to the platform, some of them is not. So again, like 
it has implications even for the platform itself. Thank you very much. I think you also answered the second part of the question. If not, please put the spark in and then we will uh, ask it in the discussion. But thanks again, the speaker, uh, Risha, for his fantastic talk, uh, very thought-provoking.